everybody. Um, so, uh, let's see. So first of all, I want to apologize a little bit because um, I'm a teacher by vocation, and um, that's uh, my main job. I, I teach at teach sociology at Santa Barbara City College as an adjunct. And uh, so um, if, if I seem a little professorial in this, or <laughs> things get a little theoretical or too historical, feel free to like wave me down, bring me back to earth. Um, but I, what I wanted to try to do today, actually, is talk, um, is to root our discussion or our thinking about the relationship between the labor movement and the Democratic Party a little bit broader and a little bit more historically. So one thing, you know, we can think about the, this relationship between these two institutions as a familial relationship. Uh, because we really, both the modern labor movement and the modern Democratic Party were really born from the same conditions, from the same social forces, from the same parts of our community. And that means, just like with your brother or sister that were born from the same parents, that sometimes you're going to fight, sometimes you're going to argue, but we really need to remember at the end of the day that we have this kinship and this common ancestry. So, the main points that I want to make today is that you know the, the modern labor movement and the modern Democratic Party have a common heritage. We share exactly the same challenges, the same basic political and social challenges right now. And I think that we really have a common future, that, um, that, that one of them will not succeed without the success of the other. I really believe that we are that joined existentially. And it's also, I want to get across that you know both institutions are really complex and decentralized, and in some ways structurally weak in the United States in comparison to other industrialized countries. And that has a lot of consequences for how we work together and sometimes how we don't work together. And I think it's possible, you know, I hear all the time in, in labor circles as someone who came up um, as a, a union member, a rank and file organizer, and a union officer, I often hear amongst my labor brothers and sisters really weird questions like, you know, you have to be for labor first and a Democrat second. And I, that's never made sense to me. I've never personally felt like I had to put one over the other or one before the other because they're both expressions, in my mind, of the same values and the same goals. But let's do a little bit of history. So um, we really do, as I said, the Democratic Party and the modern labor movement are really born of the same uh, stock and of the same social dynamics. So back in the, in the turn of the century, uh, the beginnings of the modern labor movement were really in organizations around crafts. So a lot of the oldest unions in the United States the ones that formed the original American Federation of Labor were unions of skilled workers, organized, you know, carpenters, uh, pipe fitters, um, uh, confectionery workers, brewers, people who had skills, and so if they walked off the job, the boss was screwed because they couldn't be replaced because they had a high level of skills. And those skilled workers tend to pull into the cities in the north um, to a lesser extent in the south, and so. From the very, uh, so from, from that period of time, from the turn of the century, there was a lot of cooperation and overlap between the early labor unions and the urban machines that made up the core of the Democratic Party's power in the North. So your Tammany Halls, um, the, the Boston Irish Democratic organizations, and so forth. A lot of overlapping membership between these craft unions and these very powerful machines in the cities of the North. And then something really dramatic started to change, beginning in the 1930s. And that was the rise of mass production and mass industrialization, and the birth of a new working class of people who weren't skilled, people who um, could work in an auto plant with a few days basic training and be put on, on the uh, assembly line. And these, uh, this new working class was much more diverse ethnically, um, uh, uh, weren't always native workers, a lot of immigrant workers getting hired into these big plants. And this actually became the, also the social base of the new Democratic Party from Roosevelt on. So again, the labor movement changes its organizational base from these little small craft unions to big industrial unions and the steel mills and the auto plants. And this also becomes an important base for the Democratic Party. Um, and uh, and we did a lot of really fundamentally uh, important work together that Richard alluded to. A lot of the, the core reforms and institutions that we take for granted now as having been responsible for building the middle class, 
things like social security, um, uh, in the eight hour day, uh, ending child labor, all of these things were accomplished through this alliance between the Democratic Party and the labor movement because we were both organizing and representing exactly the same people. But moving into the, as the 1950s waned and we moved into the 1960s, we both the labor movement and the Democratic Party were faced with a series of challenges. Large groups of people in the United States that had been largely left out of the New Deal and left out of the new middle class started to demand to be let in. Uh, the African American freedom struggle gets underway throughout the South and then later in the North. The women's movement starts to ask questions about women's roles in society, women's roles in the economy, etc. Uh, immigrant movements of uh, people of color start to rise up and demand a share of the pie and a share of the prosperity of the United States. And both the party and the labor movement responded to those challenges in uneven and complicated ways. Right? Um, we know that there was huge resistance within the Democratic Party to challenges from the African American freedom movement. Right? And you had these dramatic confrontations at the 1960, 1964, and 1968 Democratic conventions with groups of African American activists demanding representation and demanding uh, that the party choose the side of civil rights and abandon its base amongst white racists in the South. And those same struggles were happening within the labor movement. Those same struggles were happening both in the big industrial unions where blacks found themselves always to be the last hired and the first fired, or the ones that got relegated to sweeping up the factory floor instead of getting those uh, nice overtime shifts um, on the assembly line. So these same struggles for representation were happening within the unions and within the Democratic Party. And labor unions were themselves on both sides of this fight within the Democratic Party, right? You had unions like uh, the uh, United Auto Workers, which is actually the union that I come out of, um, which has a really, you know, not perfect, but really on the balance, really quite heroic record of standing up for civil rights. You see there's a picture there um, of the March on Washington. Um, which we all remember because uh, Brother King gave a, a, a historic speech there, and we see it as this turning point in American history. Well, a lot of people want to talk about is that entire march was paid for and the infrastructure organized by the United Auto Workers. They bus thousands of their members to that march, and all of the buses that bus African-American activists from around the South to that march, paid for by the UAW, the signs printed by the UAW. This alliance between a part of the labor movement, the progressive part of the labor movement, and the civil rights movement was incredibly powerful in forcing the Democratic Party to make this historic choice and become the party of civil rights instead of the party of Jim Crow, which as we know, it had been both. But it also meant that we had some conflicts that we didn't really work out, right? And so, you know, it was, uh, if you look historically, the labor movement nationally has endorsed every Democratic candidate, every Democratic nominee for president, except one. Do we know which one? What's that? Reagan. Reagan was the Republican. <laughs> and, and, and the labor movement did endorse, endorse Democrats against Reagan. But there was one. Lyndon Johnson, Johnson? No, of course they were all for Johnson. Johnson wasn't so correct. Who was after Johnson? McGovern, McGovern, and um, and uh, so the AFL CIO sat that one out. Said we don't know if one's better or one's worse here. We sat that one out. The biggest catastrophic defeat for the Democratic Party, right, um, up to that point, was the 1972 election when we were split, and we were split about Vietnam. We were split about race. We were split about. Feminism, we were split about the emerging uh, LGBTQ movement, right? This moment of decision for the Democratic Party that was also a moment of decision for the labor movement split us and created a historic opening for Republicans to start peeling off big parts of the New Deal coalition and the Democratic base, particularly white working class men. And that leads in the 1980s to the rise of first uh, with you know, Nixon sort of making the blueprint, but Nixon kind of screwed up on a couple things. 
um, didn't, wasn't able to finish the second term. But Reagan really brings to fruition this effort, this longer term effort by Republicans to peel off the more conservative parts of the New Deal coalition, the more conservative parts of the base, which were a lot, in a large part, union members. And that split and the fact that we had that fight within the family and couldn't get our shit together, if you give my French, part of my French, really hurt us in the long run and created this gigantic opening for the rise of the new right. So by the time when we get to the 90s, after a decade of Reaganomics, of, of aggressive vilification and aggressive uh, attacks on the labor movement, beginning right away in Reagan's first term when he fired the air traffic controllers who were on strike, how does the Democratic Party respond? Well, we have the emergence of a new kind of Democrat, uh, personified really by Bill Clinton, of a new kind of Democrat who says, we have to concede major things to Reagan. We have to concede the argument that government has become too big. We have to concede the argument that unions are too strong. And, um, and as a result, this really has accelerated the process of the party losing its white working class base. Um, and it's meant, it's put the labor movement in a very difficult position, right? Which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But um, it's a little cut off here at the end, but I want to highlight that as we get to the moment today, we once again, the labor movement and the party, both have to organize the same people, right? Because the new majority progressive coalition in this country is going to be different than it was in the 1930s. It's going to be much more immigrant, it's going to be younger workers, it's going to be feminist women, women with a social conscience, it's going to be people interested in the environment. It's a new coalition. And this was exactly the coalition that Obama won, not a very big margin, but was able to win the presidency by uniting that group of people. And those are exactly the same people that the labor movement now is trying to figure out how to organize. They're not in a factory in Wichita. They're spread throughout uh, uh, Walmart distribution centers all over the country with an aggressively anti-union employer. Right? And they're very diverse linguistically, and they're diverse culturally, and so forth. And the labor movement has to organize them, and the Democratic Party has to organize them. And if we don't see that as a common effort, we're going to be right back to 1972. So, um, how is it that we're bound together? Let me, be, let me be specific. Why do the Dems need the labor movement? Well, the first thing, and this is, Richard did a great job of talking about this. The first thing, it, it should never be the first thing on your mind as a Democrat. Should never, ever be that the most important thing about the labor movement is that they give the party and our candidates money. Because the fact is that the most important thing that the labor movement does is actually not what it does in politics. It's what it does in the workplace. It's, what, it's the day-to-day -day business of a labor movement of giving working people the power to sit down with their boss as an equal and negotiate about their wages and working conditions. And why is that the most important thing? As Richard said, it's because it is the most effective mechanism for sharing prosperity and creating an equal economy. There's no accident that you see the rise in economic inequality in this country, and it's, it's one, one line going one way, and union density and the number of workers in unions is a line going in the opposite direction. It makes an almost perfect X if you map them on, on top of each other. That's not an accident. And if our goals as a party is to have a more equal society, and I think that is one of our goals, then we need to be for the labor movement in its own terms, in its own right, for what the labor movement does best, which is banging money out of bosses. And the, the other thing is, and this is more subtle and more long term, is that unions are one of the few institutions in our society that bring people in who aren't already self-consciously progressive and gives them progressive ideas and progressive arguments and makes them interact with other communities. Right? I'll never forget having this great conversation with uh, a fellow UAW member. And one of the things that was great, I, I come out of academia, and my union represented teaching assistants at the UC, but we were organized in the UAW, which I loved, because it meant that I got to meet and work with people who worked in factories, who worked um, in uh, distribution plants, etc., cetera, um, united under the same banner, right? and talking about the same issues. And I talked to a guy, he was from central Illinois, deep, deep red country, 
um, a part of the country where, uh, where the em employers were really trying to get rid of unions. And we were talking about that gay marriage came up. And this is before we've had all these stunning victories, which is so shocking how quickly we've been making progress on this issue. So this was like 10 years ago, and gay marriage was still sort of like science fiction. Right? It was like, maybe we'll get um, uh, domestic partnerships or something. Right? So we're talking about this issue, right? And the Republicans had just won a whole bunch of seats in Congress by putting these ballot measures on banning gay marriage. And here was this brother who said, look, all of my family are super Christian, I'm a Christian, and they're all against gay marriage. And I keep arguing with them that, like, they're shutting down our schools, they're, taking, they're sending our jobs overseas, like, we can't afford to send our kids to school. Why are we arguing about whether two dudes are going to get married? Like, who cares? Okay? But where did he get that argument from? In his union. He got that argument. Right? He's not going to get it in his church. He wasn't going to get it in the bar down the street. He's not going to subscribe to Mother Jones. Right? But he got it in his union hall. And, the, and unions are one of the few institutions we have in society where regular people coming from all different backgrounds come together and are exposed to progressive values. Uh, and so, but the, it is important also, I don't mean to be churlish about this, it is important that unions give money to the Democratic Party and to our candidates. But the reason that it's important is not about just the volume of money. Because the fact is that lots of Democratic politicians and other state parties, not ours, I'm proud of this, we're very pro-union state party, but other state parties, happy to not take union money. Right? They'll take corporate money, they'll take money from individuals, and most politicians would much, much rather get, you know, a thousand checks for fifty dollars from random people, because a thousand checks for fifty dollars has no accountability with it. You can do whatever you want if you've got a thousand checks for fifty dollars. But you know, you get a ten thousand dollar check, a twenty thousand dollar check from a union, you know to get that check again, there's some expectations that come in. Corporations give money with expectations. It's very important that there are other social forces that also give money with expectations to hold elected officials accountable. So the, the thing that's important to me about union money in politics isn't the amount of money, it's the fact that it comes from unions, and it comes from people who have expectations. Um, and the other thing is, unions, if you're into grassroots politics and you believe in grassroots politics, Unions are one of the best institutions that we have that train people in grassroots politics, right? If you're 19 years old and you want to devote your life to organizing for social change and you want to, make, you want to give your life to public service, one of the best options you have for an institution that will train you and give you resources and bring you up is to work for the, the labor movement and work for unions. And those people who get trained, whether they're volunteer leaders in the unions or staffers, they live other lives. They get involved in other organizations. They get involved in their community. But they're trained and get this very, very valuable set of skills for organizing in their community from the labor movement. OK. But why, so why does labor need the Democrats? Well, the first basic reason is that the old days of moderate Republicans and both sides were kind of pro-union and you could play the parties off of one another, those days are gone. The parties have stratified on the issue of basic economic justice and have stratified on the issue of unions. I mean, the California Republican Party platform calls for making California a right-to-work state. Calls for banning political contributions by unions in the politics. It's in their platform. You read the economy plank of the California Democratic Party, and there's like just section after section about labor rights, all different kinds of labor rights, from project labor agreements to um, improving the mechanism for starting a union by instituting car check to uh, minimum wage laws, prevailing wage laws, etc. In terms of the official ideology, the official positions of the party, of the parties on labor, issues, they've never been more different. And the fact that the labor movement now is in a fight for its existence, not for higher wages versus less higher wages, the fight in so many of our states is about whether there's going to be a labor movement at all. They're passing right to work laws in Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, right? It's not Mississippi, Alabama anymore. It's in the north. And so the fact that one party 
thinks union should exist and the other one doesn't has got to be a wake-up call. Right? Secondly, while not all Democrats are labor allies, we'll talk about this, that's just a fact, some Democrats are terrible on labor, at the same time, the overwhelming vast majority of people who are pro-labor are Democrats, right? And, the, and this is a trickier one that I want to throw out there and that I hope there's some discussion and critical thinking about. The trickier thing is the fact that one of the things that being engaged in the Democratic Party as a coalition does is it really pushes the labor movement, it pushes unions to endorse and support candidates that are progressive on a broader range of issues than just bread and butter labor issues, or just union issues. Right? The fact that to be a good mainstream Democrat means you have to be pro-labor, but also pro-choice, and pro-gay rights, and pro-environment, and pro-immigrant, means that it's harder for a union to listen to, to take the path of least resistance and listen to the less better angels of their nature and say, hey, we don't care what they think about the gays and we don't care what they think about immigrants. If they're for you know, project labor agreements, then we'll support them. Right? But being engaged in the party means that it kind of pushes the, the unions to think a little more broadly, think of them as part of a, a coalition that has a range of values and not just one set of issues. Okay, that all sounds really nice, but clearly there's got, there are challenges and clearly there are issues um, uh, that come up in terms of our relationship. And part of it, I mean, we have to be self-critical as a party, part of this is the fact that a lot of really terrible things have happened to the labor movement on Democrats' watch, or by Democrats. We just have to be honest about that. Um, whether it's NAFTA and free trade agreements, and we're about to go through another round of a, of a Democratic president allying with Republicans to ram through another crappy free trade agreement that's <laughs> happening while we speak. We had the Welfare Reform Acts um, that Clinton pushed through that hurt working families really hard. Um, we have pro-education reform Democrats now, especially here in California, where Democrats are out attacking teachers' unions. Um, and, uh, and then just this kind of general fetish of deregulation, um, cutting the public sector. This is all happening also under Democrats. So labor is understandably frustrated but so is the Democratic base. So is the activist base of the party. And this is why you see things like the Howard Dean campaign being so, like, you know, lighting a fire in the grassroots and lighting people's imagination. It's why you see the continuing anti-war movement and groups like Move On persisting in the Democratic base. Um, and th this is why, wh what this comes down to is that we have a common dilemma. The Democratic base and the labor movement both have a dilemma of how do we hold elected officials accountable. We elect them, they go to office, how do we make sure that they stick to the platform and stick to our values? And the fact is that this is exactly where the labor movement and the party organization and the party grassroots need to start working together better because we have this common challenge. And I want to drill down into it a little bit um, on both the labor and the party side about what this challenge looks like. And I realized I overprepared, so I, I'm going to skip the next couple slides, which are super uh, political theory <laughs> stuff I can come back to. Skip too much, because we're, we're, um, we're going to give you guys some more time. This is just too good. Okay, well, but I, wanted, I think I want to make sure there's as much time as possible for discussion. So, look, one thing to keep in mind, right, is that neither the labor movement nor the Democratic Party are monoliths, are like, you know, all think the same thing. Um, I'd say two of the toughest political jobs in the world are being uh, a county Democratic Party chair and being the secretary treasurer of a labor council, right? You know, because it's people joke about herding cats, but this is like herding saber-toothed tigers, right? <laughs> and, um, and you've got to balance interests of public sector unions that want, like, taxes to remain reasonably high because that's what pays their salaries and pays for their program, public sector unions, uh, sorry, private sector unions who uh, don't, whose members don't want to pay taxes. You have those those conflicts within the labor movement, and then of course within Democrats, we all know, like you know, you put two Democrats in a room, you've got three opinions. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so we got we got to cut each other some slack, and understand that on both sides there's diversity of opinions, 
and we shouldn't stereotype the whole community is based on one opinion that we don't like, one leader that we don't like, etc. And there's a couple things that kind of get in the way of that. And on the Democratic side, I'd say it's a bad habit of what I call shallow partisanship. And this is a kind of path of least resistance, laziness, that is like, hey, if someone has a D next to their name and we get them elected, we've done our job. And it doesn't matter what they do after they get elected. It doesn't matter if they follow the platform or the principles of the party. We, we, we elected a Democrat. And to some extent, that's natural. It has to be that way. We have to defeat Republicans. For a, you, if you've got a Democrat who's not so good on labor issues, but they beat a Republican who wants to basically repeal all women's rights over their body, from the party perspective, that's a victory. And we have to recognize that. We have to do that. But it does mean that we often think in the short term. And it means that we end up being poll driven instead of, of, instead of going out to voters and going out to our constituents with a broader narrative of what a good society is. It also means that we tend to recruit our candidates and our leadership disproportionately from affluent parts of our community. Right? We don't do the hard work of developing leaders and developing candidates that come from immigrant backgrounds, from working class backgrounds, from poor backgrounds. Um, and it means we give our elected officials, I think, just far too much time. We're like, hey, that's really great that you got elected. You're a special snowflake. Do whatever you want. Right? <laughs> um, and again, I'd say the Dean campaign, progressive coalitions, the anti-war movements, all of these things are reactions to these problems in the party culture. People want it to mean something to be a Democrat. And at the end of the day, the party doesn't do its job if that isn't true. Right? The reason that parties are important for democracy is that instead of having 15 people all saying they love puppies and kittens, Voters get to decide between a candidate who believes in more public spending and more infrastructure and a candidate who worships the free market and wants to dismantle the welfare state. Because it shouldn't be politicians that decide that. In a democracy, people should decide that. The voters should decide that. And the only way they have that power to do that is if our candidates and our elected officials actually do what they say they're going to do and actually uphold the principles of their parties. Now I want to needle the labor movement a little bit. There's always equal opportunity critique coming up. And this is, I want to challenge something that's like the uh, historical thing in the labor movement, the kind of myth of nonpartisanship. And it's really, really important to understand that the great thing about the labor movement is that it's not organized. It doesn't start its organizing on ideological lines. The labor movement goes into a workplace and organizes everybody. It doesn't the lefties, the conservatives, whatever, it organizes everybody. That's so important for building political power and moving the needle. That's a good thing about unions, that they represent people who are not progressive. Right? Um, and it, it also means the leadership of unions, they'll get kicked out on their ass if they don't deliver goods for their members. They're accountable to their members. So, you can, you can be in an argument with somebody from, uh, uh, somebody, a, a union leader from the oil industry, who represents people in the oil industry, and you don't like fracking. And you can argue till you're blue in the face to that union leader, hey, fracking is bad for the planet, so your union should be against fracking. But that guy, I mean, if he comes to his members and is like, hey, but you guys should all just quit your jobs and not have jobs, right? He's out. We have to understand this about one another, that the, the union leaders are accountable to their members ultimately, and that that's not a bad thing. It may lead to disagreements, but it's not because they're immoral, bad people. But, but there, is a, there is a sort of problem here, and this goes back to the sort of found, one of the founding leaders of the American labor movement, Samuel Gompers, who really set this tendency in the American labor movement to be uh, nominally nonpartisan, officially nonpartisan, always a little bit skeptical of government action, in fact. There's a kind of anti-government tendency in the, in the, particularly the older parts of the labor movement, that collective bargaining between the boss and the worker is the best thing. Government should just kind of stay out of it, right? 
And even, and, and uh, this doesn't mean that they weren't militant, they didn't fight hard, but it meant that it was like, unlike the European model where unions formed parties, move, uh, labor movements formed parties here, it was like, let's get the government off our backs, we can just sit down with the boss, we'll work out a deal, right? Um, and that analysis persists even though nowadays, in 2015, we know that the decisions of government have a huge impact on the, on the private sector huge impact on which industries rise and which industries fall, huge impact through the trade agreements on whether workers who produce goods for export have a fair deal to, to sell their goods uh, abroad or we're gonna have a bunch of cheap goods dumped on us from other countries. These decisions are made politically and the labor movement needs to, I think, be recognized that there's two big fights, there's two big sides in this fight at this point. And this myth of nonpartisanship has a, a progressive expre expression. You'll hear union leaders be like, screw the Democrats, because they're unreliable. They're too conservative. They're too pro-corporate. Corporations bought the party, so screw the Democrats. You'll hear that. But you'll also hear people say, well, I, you know, screw the Democrats. They're, all they care about is gay marriage and abortion, and my members are conservative and don't want to be messed around with that, and they're too liberal. Right? You'll hear there's a conservative expression and there's a progressive expression. I think they're both problematic and that uh, labor should be doing everything it can to, to push back on those, those arguments within their membership. Here's why. Here's a bottom line, bread and butter, labor, life or death reason why. Uh, recently, the United Auto Workers uh, attempted to organize workers in Volkswagen plants in Tennessee. And this was even with the neutrality of the boss, right? They leveraged partnerships in Germany to get Volkswagen as a corporation to just to back off and be like, go for it. And even almost encouraging members to vote yes for the union. That organizing drive lost. Work, the workers voted no. And the campaign to get them to vote no had almost nothing to do with things in the factory. It was. If you join the union, the union's going to support the Democrats and give money to people who are pro-abortion and pro-gay marriage, etc. They're going to take your guns. They're going to take your money, give it to Obama, and Obama's going to show up at your house and take your gun. Right? <laughs> That's how they beat the union in the factory. So the old model, the old labor thinking of don't talk about the divisive issues and the ideology and the partisanship, we're nonpartisan. This is just about our wages with our, with, with our employer and our power with our employer, and we just support the candidates that support us, and it's not partisanship. We're sort of, at this point, the right wing has married unions and the Democratic Party in the minds of everybody, it's kind of time that we recognize that that's the fact. And that if we can't push our members to realize that it doesn't matter if their neighbor's gay and married, and what does matter is whether they have a job, if we're not willing to push our members on that, we're going to continue to lose labor fights on political grounds. So I think that the solution to all of this, the thing that we need to get, get to is actually an increase in partisanship, but a grassroots kind of partisanship, a partisanship uh, about the organization and pride and loyalty to the Democratic Party as an organization, not, as a, not any given elected official, any given leader, but to start, all of us should feel like this is our party. And, um, and because the leverage that we have as Democrats, think about it. When candidates come to you and ask you for your endorsement and you give that endorsement and then they get elected, do they have to call you back and ask how to vote on things? No. They can do whatever they want, but they should. And the only way that you can force them to do that, right, the only leverage that the party has is the power of its brand, of withdrawing that brand and saying, no, you're not the Democrat, because you keep voting to privatize everything. Right? So we have that power of the brand, and we have our shoe leather. We have our organizational power. We can, as a party organization, decide we're only going to endorse candidates that are good on our issues, as many of our issues as possible, and we're going to back that up by knocking on all of the doors and getting that person elected. And it, 
They go sideways. Next time, we'll run somebody else. That's the only power we have to influence electives. And guess what? That's the same power that the labor movement has. Neither of us get to automatically call up an elected official and say, just because I'm calling from the labor movement, you have to do what I say. And I don't get to call my elected officials in Santa Barbara County and say, I'm the party chair. You have to, say what, you have to do what I say. Both of us only have power insofar as we can organize to replace somebody who's, who's gone against us. And if we recognize that, then I think we start to see that there's a path for the labor movement to engage even more heavily, heavily in the grassroots of the party. Because that is added leverage that labor can have over the elected officials. And so, um, so my argument to the labor movement is always, if you're, you're pissed about the Democratic Party or you don't like your elected officials or you don't think they're re reliable, show up. Right? Get engaged. Take over the clubs. Turn the clubs into effective uh, campaign organizations. And do exactly what you know how to do outside of the party. Do it in the party. Right? And get that added leverage of the party brand. Um, and the flip side of that, eventually the next slide is uh, a little more explicit about this. The flip side of that is that we, the Democratic Party needs to make sure that all of its activists and all of its members and all of its donors and everybody engaged in the party understands what unions are and what the labor movement is. And that's why doing this program here is so great and I really want to congratulate you on doing it. But this should happen in every club all over the state. And that's on the party. That's our responsibility. I mean, we can ask for help from the labor movement to, to do that, but we need to take the responsibility to do that. And then there's really specific, practical things that you could do to help uh, make sure that our relationship stays strong and doesn't spin out of control when we have disagreements. The first is that there's, as Democrats, we should never, ever, ever use anti-labor conservative rhetoric. You don't like something that a union did, like you don't agree with an enforcement, that's fine. We're going to disagree about stuff, right? But you, then you start bashing the union bosses or union thugs, right? You're just handing power to, to the right, to the republic. And lest you think that that's like never happens, it happens all the time, right? And it happens even from self-described progressives in the party, right? I never, I'll never forget hearing uh, one of the leaders of the progressive caucus, thank God, not the chair. Thank you. Thank God. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> But somebody who ran for chair a couple times, and I was speaking on a panel with him, and he didn't like the fact that the teachers' union, uh, the CTA, had uh, taken a different position on a campaign finance uh, measure that he supported. And so he just launched on this tirade about the union bosses. And, oh, the rank and file are okay, but those union bosses are the problem. He sounded exactly like Republicans who say, we love the rank and file members of the unions, they want lower taxes and smaller government just like this. It's the union bosses that want big government and liberalism and blah, blah, blah. We should never, ever reinforce that narrative as Democrats. Ever. So disagree with the union. I don't like what IBW made this decision. I don't like the Teamsters making that decision. I don't agree with that. They should have done this other thing. That's fine. We're going to disagree. But never use their rhetoric. And likewise, I hear from labor people all the time these gigantic sweeping generalizations about the Democrats. Right? So, like for example, when the governor um, uh, you know, pushed this horrific carve out for um, domestic workers uh, on overtime, right? Awful. Right? And then I so my Facebook feed would like blew up. Oh, this is typical Democrats and the Democrats and the Democrats. All of the Democrats in the legislature voted on the right side of that. The Democratic Party is on the right side of that. Yeah, so our governor did a, a bad thing. I'm just as frustrated about it as anybody in UPW is. Let's work together to put pressure on the governor to move him. But we have to start seeing each other as allies in that struggle and not as enemies in that struggle. Otherwise, we're right back to 1972. And that's where I'll end.